passion turns ever more rapidly as we grow ever closer to Calvary. Though our lives go on in the common things and the regular things, we eat and sleep and go to work and spend time with our families, we watch television and go through the regularness of our lives. For us as Christians, for us as Christians, the season of Lent, the season of the Passion, has such a different meaning. The wheel of the Passion of our Lord continues to turn. It moves in our lives in ways that, that, that change our, our thinking and our being and our doing, our direction, our purpose, our hope, our assurance, all of that through this great and wondrous gift that God gives in His Son for you and for me. A deal had been struck. We know what it was, if we're familiar, if we've been down this journey before, if we've traveled the road before with Jesus, if we were here before, then we know a deal had been struck. It was really a rather simple thing. They wanted to get rid of him, the religious leaders, because this Jesus of Nazareth was a threat to them, a threat to their power and their position, to the people that were following them. They thought they didn't want him taking them away. He was a threat, and so they put out the word that they wanted help getting rid of him in a deal had been struck. Among the twelve was one who, by the, by the grace of the Father, think of this, by the will of the Father, by the purpose of the Father, one had been selected out of the twelve. One to carry out the work. One that was set aside in ways that the other disciples didn't immediately recognize, probably didn't know until after the fact. One had been set aside and a deal had been struck. For thirty pieces of silver, the price of a slave. Judas of Iscariot consented that with the chief priests and elders he would do something that maybe nobody else could do because he was on the inside. He was part of the inner circle. He could give Jesus up. The right circumstance, the right place, the right time, he would give him up. He had been in the upper room. Though Jesus kicked him out. And the Bible says that Satan entered into him. It's a remarkable thing. Judas had been in the upper room, and so he had a really good idea. Maybe, maybe based on the conversation that had went on, where Jesus was going. He had been there before. And so Judas saw opportunity. Uh, a deal had been struck. And while they traveled out to the Garden of Gethsemane, and, and Jesus struggled with the Father about this cup, this will that was about to occur, while Jesus struggled, and the disciples slept, Judas went. A deal had been struck. He went to lead them, to show them, to bring them. And so we come to this. Stand up tonight. Stand up. Stand up. What you see me do, you do too. And listen. Do this. Do it more. Do it louder. Do this. And listen. Be seated. <laughs> that was the sound. They were coming. He had prayed and struggled and Sweat like great drops of blood, the scripture says. And then they were coming. They were coming to arrest him. They were coming to get him. They were coming. They were, they were coming, this group of chief priests and elders, this crowd, this mob. They were coming. coming. And at the sound of, at the sound of the crowd approaching, Jesus, Jesus had all kinds of choices. He could have just simply left. Do you think for a moment they could have stopped him? Do you think if he chose to simply get up out of the garden, hearing the mob coming, knowing what was coming, do you think they, do you think they could have stopped him? He could have, he could have simply just stepped away. Walked past them or, or through them or, or by them. And they'd have never known, couldn't have stopped him even if they could see him. If he had chosen, Jesus could simply have walked away. He could have used his power to resist. Think of this. This was, this was a man who was God. In every way divine. What would they have been up against him? This one who had given sight to the blind and made the lame walk and raised the dead. What do you suppose they could have done? Jesus could have used his power to resist. He could have, in fact, he said this. He said this to disciples. He could have called on legions of angels. 12,000 in a legion. Did you know that? 
Jesus said to them, I can call, I can call my father and he'll send legions of angels. And you think, how many, how many angels would have been taken to protect him? Instead, as the crowd approaches, he does nothing but wait. He knows who is coming. He knows what is coming. He knows what every minute and every hour that lay ahead of him, what it would hold for him, what it would engage him in, what it would involve for him, what it would feel like, what it would look like. Jesus knew every part. Think of this. He knew every part that was coming. He knew it all. And yet, yet he chooses to do the hardest thing and the best thing. He chooses to stay. He does, he does love ones because that was the plan in the Father's heart from eternity, from the time of the rebellion of Adam and Eve, down through the generations, the unfolding of human history, all these things that the hand of God was in, all of it was part of this plan. And the plan had come to this point in the garden. He had other choices, but really only one. Jesus chooses to stay because it's part of the plan. The Father's perfect, loving, willful, purposeful plan. He chooses to stay, my loved ones, because we, listen to me, we need him too. Maybe at the heart and soul, we need to hear this out loud on this lead evening. Jesus stands as the crowd comes, as the mob comes, as the soldiers and the chief priests and the elders and those that follow. As the crowd comes, Jesus just stands and he waits because we, you and I, we need him to. We can't be saved if he doesn't. We can never know forgiveness if he doesn't. We can never, we can never be healed if he doesn't, Jesus stays. Jesus stays because he loves us. There's this remarkable episode, we heard it tonight, that in the middle of this, as the disciples are trying to react to what is happening, as they're trying to be part of what is happening, as they're trying in their own futile way to protect him with a protection that he didn't need, that they take the sword, Simon Peter reaches over and he takes his sword and he swings away and he cuts off the right ear of Malchus, the servant. And Jesus reaches up and heals it. And then he gives up. And he gives in. And he does it for you. And he does it for me. It is, it is remarkable love. The kind that has the power to, to touch our hearts and shape our lives. It's a love that reaches right in here and changes us. The weight of it and, and the wonder of it. it. Cleanses what needs cleansing. It heals what needs healing. It forgives what needs forgiving. Washes out all the sin and all the stain and all the wrong and all the rebellion and all the unholiness, all the unrighteousness. This love, this wondrous love reaches inside of us and it changes our hearts. On top of that, you know this, Christians, when we are reached inside, when the love of this Jesus who stands in the garden gives himself up for you and for me, when it reaches us inside, it it gives us courage because we know that he stands with us in the course of our living, in the places of our lives that are too big for us, where we're not strong enough or deep enough or wise enough or powerful enough. This, this Jesus, 
He stands with his children as he stood with his disciples. He stands with each one of us, loved, redeemed, blood-bought. He stands with us, and it gives us courage. Even more, more than anything else, that love, listen, that love grows in us a deep desire to follow him. It is such a remarkable thing. In their humanity, because they were afraid, because they saw what was happening and couldn't stop it, because there was something that was out of their control, the scriptures say to us, and it, it just strikes us, they fled. These disciples, they turned and they ran. We listen tonight as he gives himself up in the garden for us. As the footsteps come and Jesus willfully and willingly and wondrously and lovingly gives himself up for us, it grows inside of us, this great love he has for us, it grows inside of us a deep desire to follow him. You and me, in the midst of the regularness of our lives, in the moments of our Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays, in the places of our Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays and Sunday mornings as his people, it, for us it just grows inside of us the desire to follow this Jesus. Tonight, tonight if we listen with our hearts, we can hear the sound of footsteps. Here he waits. He's calm and resolute. Here he waits, choosing what is needful for you and me. Here he, here he waits with you and me on his mind and in his heart. Tonight, amid the noise of tramping feet, This is love. And we praise. If you would rise, please.